I invite you to turn to John chapter 10 and your copy of God's Word. We're going to finish the chapter this morning. Been in here for a while, but it's been good to look at the Good Shepherd this slowly and this intentionally. We're going to be picking it up in about verse 31, and we're going to go all the way through to the end, verse 42. But before we get to thinking about the words that are here in the scriptures for us, think about the words that we hear every day, all day long. We live in a pretty verbally volatile world. I mean, we, we can all agree to that, I think. I mean, words and statements and, and postings, they're just bantied about frantically all the time in our, in our culture, whether it be on TV, conversations, social media. You know, and you, you think about the news, how much of the news sometimes is just reporting on what people said or what people tweeted or what people posted on Facebook or what they were recorded as saying in some journal article or things like that. And the news used to report on what people did. And now we talk about what they said. And social media has become kind of the fire and the diesel for that, has it not? That it's the fuel and the flame. We talk about people losing their jobs for something they wrote on social media seven years ago, eight years ago, ten years ago. I mean, words now are, we call them violence, and they're punishable as hate speech. And didn't we used to say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? We never really believed that, though, right? Like, that was never actually true. Like, it was something you said to kind of just tough it up and, and quit crying. But they all have, have been important, right? Words. They always have meaning, and they've always affected us. And didn't it used to be said also that actions speak louder than words? We used to say that, and now it doesn't really so much matter in our day, right? It doesn't matter what you've done. You said this five years ago. Or you posted this six months ago. And it kind of undoes your actions in a sense. See, good works are often easily forgotten when unpopular words are spoken by the doer of those good works. Talks without action are unwelcome, right? Like, we don't, we don't accept anything like, oh, you're, you're all talk. You got to back it up. You got to walk the walk and talk the talk, right? We, we don't understand that. But equally the same that we don't often, we don't have a trite saying for is your words can undo your actions. At least in our day and age, that actions are going to fade into memory instantly when words are spoke or spoken that the listener doesn't like. Why is that the case? When we think about that, like, why is that the case? Why do we think that your actions fade into memory when words are spoken that are unpleasant? I think there's a biblical reality to that, that words reveal your heart. Words reveal what you actually believe. They're impactful because they communicate your innermost beliefs and convictions. That's a biblical idea. Jesus says, Luke 6, 45, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of his heart, the mouth speaks. What's inside comes outside. And then we naturally just believe that. Words are equally offensive or inspiring. So they can be just as offensive and just as inspiring. For what reason? Because the listeners believe that you mean what you say. You can say anything that you want, right? As long as nobody thinks that you actually believe it, right? I could say anything I want, but if you think I believe it, then there's going to be inspiration or there's going to be frustration. But if I don't mean it, and you, don't, and you know that I don't mean it, I don't really believe it, then it doesn't, doesn't really matter. So this is the station we left Jesus in last week, right? Remember how we finished? Jesus was, he's, all he said is, in this chapter is, I am the good shepherd, I lay down my life for the sheep, my sheep hear my voice, they know me, I'm not like the thieves and the robbers because the sheep won't follow thieves and robbers, they will follow me because I'm actually the shepherd, I'm the door of the sheepfold, nobody comes in, nobody goes out without going through me. He said all of those things, and that seems pretty benign in a sense, right? And then they go, okay, just quit goofing around and quit annoying us and just tell us, are you really the Christ? Whether, tell us whether or not that's true. And then he goes on, I'm not going to play your game, and he explains a little bit more about him and the Father being one. 
And then that flips them into a rage in verse 31. They picked up stones again to stone him. This is where we left Jesus last week. That everybody has rock in hand. And they're about to stone him. Or they want to stone him. They want to kill it for him. His words rouse death at the beginning of the passage. At the beginning of our, our text right now, kind of what, the ending of this Good Shepherd monologue. But at the end of our passage, by verse 42, it's going to achieve life. It roused the crowd to want to kill him. But by the end of the passage, it's going to bring people to life. Because Matthew 4.4 4 is true. Jesus just quoting from Deuteronomy. But Jesus answered, this, he answered Satan tempting him in the wilderness. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. What do we live by? What are we kept alive by, sustained by? Every word that comes from the mouth of God. And that's where Jesus is going to center on this text. In verses 31 through 42, it's all going to be about the words. The words. Works are going to play an uh, ancillary role. They're there, and they're real, and they matter. But the words that Jesus speaks as one who is truly God, they're going to be what the crux of the whole issue is going to be about. Verses 31 through 33, Jesus is going to be hated for the words. Look at verses 31. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? Is Jesus being smarmy here? Just kind of being a smart aleck, as I was often called by older generations in my family? Is that what he's being? Or is he intentional? He's, is he making them go on the record? I want you guys to say out loud so that it can be pinned down by one of my disciples forever why you want to stone me. So which of my good deeds are you stoning me for? He's making them go on the record so that we can read it 2,000 years later and understand the heart of man that does not love Jesus and in fact hates him and wants to kill him. What is that heart like? He's teaching us 2,000 years in the past. Verse 33 they're going to go on record. They're going to answer. The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself to be God. Put yourself in this situation. Jesus, he's, remember, he's in the colonnade of Solomon. It's wintertime. It's near Hanukkah. And he has this moment where he's telling them these things and explaining to them further about being the good shepherd, that he and the Father are one. And now everybody has scattered and gotten rocks and has come back. They went and found rocks. Some people think that it was, there was part of the temple that was under construction, and they just went to the construction site and picked up debris. And now they're going to come and stone Jesus. And then Jesus, in that moment, he doesn't flee. He doesn't run. He doesn't back down. He just says, hey, wait, 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 wait. Before you guys start heaving boulders, why are you doing this again? What is it for? Let's just be clear. Before you try to stone me, why? What's your motivation? Explain your heart. And they're willing to go along with it. Why would you? I mean, if you're enraged enough to put somebody to death for blasphemy that we'll see here in a minute, if you're enraged enough to do that, why would you answer the question? Wouldn't you just put him to death? I mean, he's already committed a, a heinous Old Testament sin, blaspheming God. In your mind, at least, that's what he's done. Why would you answer? Because self-righteous people, that's who they are. They're self-righteous they never doubt that their motives spring out of rightness. They never doubt that. They never doubt for a second that their actions and their motives are wrong. So they're like, yeah, we'll tell you exactly why we're going to kill you. Not because of anything that you did, but because of what you said. That's why we're going to kill you. We're not going to kill you for your actions. We're going to kill you for your words. Now think about this. We've seen a lot in, so, so, so timeline-wise, John, or in John's gospel, Jesus' public ministry is done. This is the last moment. The next thing that he does is going to be chapter 11. It's a private family matter with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Their family is going to be contained. That's a private ministry moment. And then after that, chapter 12 and following is the, the, the uh, upper room. So it's just him and his disciples up in the upper room. So publicly, this is the last big moment. 
And we know from the other Gospels that Jesus has done a lot of miracles. John has only recorded six so far. The last big one's going to be in chapter 11. But he's done tons of miracles. He's turned the water into wine. He's fed the 5,000. He's healed the lame. He's healed the blind. He's healed the sick. He heals Peter's mother-in-law. He's cast out demons. He's walked on water. He's done all of these miracles. And he's escaped from the hordes of crowds trying to kill him at least two or three times. They've seen miraculous things. They've seen plenty of miraculous things. And if John's words at the end of his gospel are true, which we take them to be so, that if we recorded all that Jesus did, it would fill, it, there's too much to fill all the books in the world. They've seen miracles. And yet, in this moment, because of what he said, because of verse 30, I and the Father are one. A short first grade sentence that can be diagrammed by anybody who's gone past fifth grade. Those words, we're going to kill you. All that you've done in the past, all that we've seen you do, all that's been testified, because it hasn't just been the poor people, it's been all the way up to the wealthy, right? Jairus, the official, we saw his son get healed. Because we're going to ignore all of that, and we're going to put you to death for this. All of your acts of mercy, all of your acts of love and kindness, they're forgotten and irrelevant. Christian, take notice, because the same will be true for us. Do you remember back in 2020 when COVID was raging and nobody really even knew what was going on and things were especially bad in places like New York City? And then Samaritan's Purse takes their field hospitals and sets them up in Central Park. And then what they what is found out about Samaritan's Purse within weeks or days even of them being there is that they hold to a biblical understanding of marriage between one man and one woman for life. And then the city of New York revolts against them and says, get out of here. We don't want you to keep us alive during COVID. We don't want your free medical care. We don't want any of that stuff because of what you believe. We don't care about the good that you're doing. We don't care about the act of mercy. We don't care that you're footing the bill. We hate you for what you believe. So if the same was true for Jesus, then we has to be true for us. They will love us for feeding the poor, but they will hate us for our beliefs. What does James 1.27 say? That pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to keep oneself unstained by the world and to visit orphans and widows in their distress. The world loves half of that definition of pure and undefiled religion. The world hates the other half. How do you keep yourself unstained by the world? You know the truth. You're set free by the truth, and you follow and obey only the truth. They hate that part, but they love the other part the visiting orphans and widows in their distress, the mercy ministry that we are commanded to do as a church. And the one will always wipe out the other. The we, we cannot clothe enough homeless people for the, to keep the world from hating us on our stance on marriage or abortion or just go down the list. We can't do enough. Because if Jesus can't do enough, we can't do miracles. Jesus can do miracles and did do miracles, too many to count in front of people, and they still want to kill him right now. But did they have a point? Well, let's answer this. Because you, being a man, make yourself to be God for blasphemy. That's why we're going to kill you. Now, that is a heinous Old Testament sin, as we looked at before, Leviticus 24, 16. Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him. The sojourner as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. So to blaspheme the name of God, to make it low, to, to, to attribute something to God that's not true, of whatever level that it is, that God is a man, or uh, that I am God, that, that, that's Satan's big sin, right? It's blasphemy that gets him kicked out of heaven. That's ultimately Adam and Eve's big sin, right? You'll be like God. They're like, oh, well, if you say that, then we'll go ahead and take this fruit. It's, all, it's blasphemy, right? That, this is the sin, and it is a heinous sin. But let's not get it twisted. Let's not think that all of a sudden they've become extremely biblical, faithful people. They haven't. When does the first time they wanted to kill him? In chapter 5, after he did what? He heals the paralyzed man who's been paralyzed his entire life. Now they want to kill him for that. And then they want to kill him again in chapter 8. 
So this isn't new. They haven't just suddenly like, okay, we were with you for a while, but now you violated the word of God. They don't care about the word of God. We'll see that here in a minute. Calvin described them like this. He said, their unbelief is the mother of rage, and the devil hurries on the wicked in such a matter that they breathe nothing but slaughter. See, they're not Old Testament faithful, just Old Covenant faithful Jews. They're bloodthirsty unbelievers under the power of the prince of the air. But blasphemy is a deadly, serious offense because Leviticus 24 is true. But Jesus didn't blaspheme. That's that's the charge that we're going to have to deal with now. He didn't blaspheme by saying that he is God because it's true. He is God. If you say, I am God, and you are God, you don't blaspheme. That's true. Now, ironically, what do they say? They say in verse 33, for you, man, make yourself God. Isn't it actually the opposite? Jesus being God made yourself a man? That's what John 1 says. So their charge is actually reversed that, that, that they have brought against him. But you know what he's going to do? He's going to take a different tactic with them. He's not just going to say, well, I am God, so this is irrelevant. He's going to show them under the theme of words, the word of God, you're not even right based on your terms. I'm going to play on your terms. I'm going to play according to your field dimensions, and I'm going to play according to your rules, rules, and you're still going to lose. You're still wrong. Verse 34 through 36 Jesus is going to appeal to the Bible. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? Now, this is from the passage that we, that we had uh, Scott read this morning. And if you've, as the first time you come across that obscure psalm, it's not very popular, especially because it's not one of David's, it's a psalm of Asaph. And it says in there that, that God holds counsel among the gods, and that God said to them, I said you were gods. And Jesus is quoting from that obscure psalm, Psalm 82, right here. So he's not going to claim that they misunderstood his claim to deity, but what he's going to do is, is that you don't even have proof, you don't even have grounds for, to prove blasphemy on your own terms. Based on the Bible, you don't have grounds for that. They're going to be challenged on basic Bible knowledge. Not integral or intricate theology or nuances of prophecy. He's not going to challenge them on that. He's going to challenge them on just content. Does it not say? What does he say in verse 34? Is it not written in your law? Not that it's theirs and not his, but the one that you claim. Haven't, ha, have you ever read it? And that Jesus in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he says that phrase over and over and over again to the Pharisees. Have you never read? Have you ever read the Bible? And then he just quotes it. That's what he's doing right here. Have you ever even read it. He's not asking, so we can make an illustration, he's not asking it, or challenging them on their understanding of music theory. I don't know what that is, but I come, my wife's family is all musicians, and they say that there's a thing called music theory. Music doesn't seem very theoretical to me. If you punch on those white things, noise comes out. It's pretty practical. But there's a thing out there called music theory, and he's not challenging them on that. He's just saying, do you even know the songs in the hymnal? Not how they're constructed or how it was originally written by the Wesley brothers. He's not looking at that. He's like, do you just know the titles in the hymnal? Are you familiar with the tune? That's what he's going after here. He's not going after deep intricacies. He just quotes from Psalm 82, verse 6, where God says, I said to somebody, you are God's sons of the Most High, all of you. But when we read that psalm, Did you notice the context was justice and judgment? And did you notice that the gods were little g? The context in Psalm 82 is is that God is outraged against those that he's put underneath him to represent him to carry out his judgment and his justice among the people. They're not doing that. These judges are not doing what God has told them to do. They're not representing them. I said, God says, that you are God's, meaning you represent me and you're failing to do that. And so now my judgment's gonna come on you for your lack of carrying out my judgment on the people, my justice on the people. That's the, the, the context. So saying that you are God's, 
Does that mean that they are gods? We, we think about that. Like, well, when it comes to the, to the law, even in our land, just the law of the land, we talk, what do we call police, or at least to, you used to in like old-timey movies. When I say old-timey, I mean like Paul Newman and Robert Redford movies. That's old-timey to us. Sorry to some of you who are a little older. Those seem common. Um, but what did it say? Like, oh, I fought the law, and the law won. Or the law came and got me. Or Johnny Law is coming for me. I ran from the law. But what are you really running from? You're running from police officers, right? You're running from detectives. You're running from, you're running from cops. They're not the law, but what do they represent? The law, right? Or you think about, like, just move further up the chain. We have these unelected officials that are on our highest court called what? Justices. They are a justice, but they're not a justice. What are they supposed to do? They're supposed to carry out justice. That's their job, right? So they're supposed to represent what they do officially but they don't always do that they don't always live up to that that happen, we see that in other areas as well uh, oftentimes in the fall on different saturdays some there's 11 guys that'll get on a square rectangle of grass in austin texas and call themselves football players they don't really represent what football is but they're supposed to correct i, I got to get in all my digs before they get into the sec so then it's going to change and it's going to be like normal again. <laughs> but we often see things that represent what they're not, what they're supposed to, and they do it poorly, right? That's what God is saying in Psalm 82. That's the context. Jesus is pointing out something devastating to these self righteous people that he is God, and he can say that without transgressing, but even playing by their rules, he hasn't blasphemed because all he said is that I and God are one. Just like these judges in Psalm 82 were supposed to be one with God, right? They're supposed to be one. You do what God says. That's all that you do. That's what they're supposed to be doing. So in verse 35, he says, If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? He's, if he can call, if God can call, his human representatives, gods, in Scripture, and Scripture cannot be broken, meaning it's infallible. It is inerrant. That's what Jesus is making. So we should pause here and note this. Jesus is making a case for the inerrancy of the Bible based on what? One word in Psalm 82, a psalm that when it popped up on our screen today, nobody was like, oh, yes, I love this one. I even had to go read it this, this week and go, man, I got to refamiliarize myself with this because that's not Psalm 23. That's not Psalm 51. That's not Psalm 19. That's not Psalm 1 or Psalm 2 or Psalm 8. Psalm 82. And Jesus is making a case for the inerrancy of the Bible based off of one word in one obscure psalm written by the sons of Asaph. The, the, he says the scripture cannot be broken. You guys agree to that. I agree to that in his dialogue right here. You know, what's funny is we see that the Bible stands on its own. It doesn't need the correction, the help, or the assistance of some kind of self-righteous religious elites at all. It is the Bible. That's where, that's where any controversy that we have should be fought. And even in our day, what do, we, what do we like to get mad about in our day? What do we fight about in the concerns of the Bible? We fight about translations, don't we? Are you NIV people? That's the nearly infallible version. <laughs> are, are, you, are you NASB people? That's the non-Arminian standard Bible. Are you ESV people? That's the elect standard Bible. <laughs> I mean, we, we go around that, but then who, who do we always have to come down and wrestle with? This is the King James only Bible people, right? And when they're, they're like, well, you know, how could you say that? Like, you, you know, this is the Lord's tongue. This is what he spoke. And I love the King James. I'm reading it for my devotions these days. But a lot of times what they'll do is, They'll come and say, well, you, you, the, your Bible has perverted what the Word of God says. And I'm like, well, let me just use the King James and talk to you about it. And, and usually they're not very Calvinistic people who are King James only. Like, so I like to say the greatest Calvinists in history were King James. Brother, let's sit down and get into the King James. And they never like that. Never like that. Because the Bible can stand on its own. That Jesus has put the weight of his defense of people who have rocks in their hands. He's in front of the firing squad. 
And he's put the weight of his defense on one word from one obscure psalm against the charge of blasphemy. That really makes 2 Timothy 3.16 come to life, doesn't it? All scripture is theonoustos, breathed out by God. That Jesus is making his defense off of one word. But then the logic comes in in verse 36. Do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, meaning me, he's consecrated, he's sanctified, he's, he's commissioned me as holy and sent me? He, he's, if he's done that for me, why are you saying that I'm blaspheming because I say I'm the Son of God? He said it to immoral men. He called men who were perverting the role of judge and the execution of justice, he called them gods, and I haven't done any of those things. So why are you mad at me for me saying that I am the Son of God and he commissioned me and sent me? See, following Jesus' logic, he's just using the Bible. He says, I am the Word, I sent by and consecrated by the Father. The, the unjust representatives were called gods. Why can't I be? Well, I'm, I've been just. The prophets spoke in the Old Testament and John the Baptist as the voice of God. Right? They would say, thus says the Lord. Moses leads the people as God, right? His voice is as the voice of God. God's not speaking to all people. He speaks to Moses. But Moses is not God. Moses doesn't even get to go to the promised land. So God can't use fallible people. So this crowd isn't zealous for God's holy name. They're just unrepentant unbelievers. And that's seen in their actions. Paul describes the, the heart of an unbeliever like this in Romans 3, 13 through 18. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. We've seen that with these people. Their feet are swift to shed blood. No trial, no, no considering the Roman oppressors that they can't, you can't put anybody to death. You've got to talk to Rome. They were going to do it anyways. They were swift to shed blood. And their paths are ruin and misery. They, they said that they're miserable. Jesus, stop making us miserable and just tell us who you are. And the way of peace they have not known. They live exceedingly unpeaceful lives. There is no fear of God before their eyes. See, this crowd is not confused, but still pious. This crowd is not good intended, but just misinformed. They're what Jesus called them. You are whitewashed tombs. You look pretty on the outside, but inside is just dead men's bones. That's what you are. So he appealed to the word, but now he's going to give a witness to the word that they can't deny. Verse 37, he, if I'm not doing the works of my father. Remember, you guys disregarded my works earlier when I asked you which works are you going to kill me for. That Jesus is saying. If I'm not doing the works of my father, then don't believe me. If I'm not doing what God actually would have anyone do, then don't believe me. If the things that you see me doing are ungodly, then don't believe me. Don't listen to me. Nobody should listen to me if that's what I'm actually doing. The proof is in the pudding. Another trite cliche. We had a few earlier before. Don't, don't imitate me. Don't listen to me if I'm not doing what God would say. See, he's not irate that he's being evaluated as a leader, as a speaker, as one who speaks for God, as a preacher. He's not irate that he's being evaluated. He's just demanding to be evaluated upon what's actually true. Honestly evaluate me. Verse 38. But if I do them, meaning if I do the works of my Father, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Hey, even if... Even if you hate everything that I say, just let your eyes be honest. What have I done? What have I actually done? If you're going to say that what I said was blasphemy, go back and evaluate the things that I've done. Would, shouldn't it cause you to pause on your bloodthirsty rage to put to death a blasphemer if that blasphemer also fed 20,000 people with just a handful of fish and bread? Shouldn't you pause and think, Maybe this guy is not worthy of being put to death because I did see him make a paralyzed person come to life. You know, he, <laughs> he did cast demon out of the worst guy in our whole village, and those demons went into the pigs, and the pigs all fell off the cliff. Maybe we should think about this and reconsider. That's what Jesus is asking to happen. He says, even though you hate what I say, let your eyes see what I've done. Have I harmed anyone? 
Have I made anyone's life worse? What rebellions has Jesus instigated? Who has Jesus deprived? Who has been conned by him? Is Jesus wealthy? Or is he a drifter, in a sense? He has no place to lay his head, he says. Foxes have holes, birds have nests, the Son of Man has no way to lay his head. Does he have any new political power? Are people like, yeah, let's make Jesus in charge? He's not. He doesn't have any of those things. You know, at times, we as the church need to say that. Please, please, before you hate us and you villainize us, can you just evaluate what we do? Can you see the good that we do? Come to one of our fellowship meals and know that you'll be loved. Come on Sunday morning. Know that you'll be welcomed and respected, treated with dignity. Look at what we do. Look at our actions. The life of Christians should cause the church's antagonists to reconsider their animosity. They won't because they don't for Jesus, but it should on paper. See, success in this area for the 21st century church, it looks a lot like Pilgrim's Progress, where faithful and, pil- and uh, Christian are in Vanity Fair. And as soon as they show up in Vanity Fair, Vanity Fair is just a city of, of debauchery. It's always a carnival, but Satan's obviously the one running it. And, and ev- ev- as soon as faithful and Christian walk in to the town, they're immediately swarmed. And then they're locked up and they're hated. But it says, but the men being patient and not rendering railing for railing, but contrawise blessings, so not cursing for cursing, but blessing instead, and giving good words for bad words and kindness for injuries done. That's how they behave when they're so mistreated. Then it says, but Christian and faithful behave themselves yet more wisely and receive the ignominy and shame that was cast upon them with so much meekness and patience that it won to their side several of the men in the fair. That though they were bombasted and they're locked in this cage, and they're they're treated like like the war, like like a threat to society. They just keep returning love for hatred, kindness, their meekness, and it wins several of the men in the story of Pilgrim's Progress. They see, wait a minute, they're better than the best of us. What are we doing? Other, we have plenty of other guys we shouldn't be locking up and putting in, putting in chains. So us today in the church that if they hate us for our words like they did Jesus then we need to be able to say evaluate our actions just like Jesus did if they hate us for our words and they will words meaning what we believe what we profess and confess to be true then we need to be able to say like Jesus we'll just evaluate our actions we won't win the majority but God may be pleased to win some to win some to his kingdom through our faithfulness in word and in deed. And that shouldn't discourage us because the same was true for Jesus' ministry. And even here at the end, when he's pleading for just honesty, look at my witness of my life to the, to the evidence of my words. At the end of his life, at the end of this moment, not the end of his life yet, he's still gathering sheep into his fold. Even in this threat of death, in verses 39 through 42, he's gathering sheep into his fold, kind of the end, the button on the Good Shepherd chapter of John in verse 39. But they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. They want to arrest him, they want to harm him, but they can't. Have we seen this before? We have. John 7, 30. They were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. John 7, 44. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. John 8, 59. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Why is this here again? Why repeat this, John? Why tell us three, four, and five times that they wanted to kill him, they wanted to arrest him, they wanted to capture him, but they couldn't. They couldn't do what they wanted to do. And they had the power to do it. They are the ones in charge. They are the religious elites. Why are they not able to do what they want to do? Why repeat this? Because our Savior, the Son of the living God, Jesus of Nazareth, is not a victim. He is not a martyr. Death was not a mere example of his humble godliness. We saw earlier in John 10, 17 and 18, 
For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it, my life, from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. Christ's substitutionary death on the cross was always part of God's decree. In the covenant of redemption, where the Trinity had never had to like have this meeting, but we in our minds had to think about it chronologically, to have a meeting to say, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a world and a universe. And you, son, you, the second member of the Trinity, are going to go and, and take on flesh like they have after they sin against us. And you're going to be the redeemer for all of them. That was always a part of the plan. That was never not going to happen. Jesus' death is not an accident. He was not a martyr. That just is an example for us. Here's how you live in peaceful resistance. Here's what may happen to you if you just go on the meek and, and then humble way. And so that may have to happen to you, but it's just a good example for us to not put up a fight and just let yourself be killed. He's the ultimate martyr, the ultimate victim. He's not. He's in charge. And he wasn't just saying, okay, Heavenly Father, I'll do what you say. It was his idea. If this is happening in the inner Trinitarian reality, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all God in essence, all of the same mind, same essence, it wasn't like the Father was off in his room, closed up, and said, you know what, I think this is what we're going to have to do. I'm going to go and present it to the other guys, see what they think. That was never part of it, because Jesus is God. So this was his idea. So nothing was going to happen outside of his plan. It was never going to be ramrodded down to the moment. Peter preaches that in Acts 2 and in Acts 4, when he says that Jesus was delivered up by the predetermined plan of God, and you put him to death. So you really did it, but it was always going to happen. That God's plan was never in danger of not happening. Nobody is in control of the universe. Nobody is in control of the history of redemption except the God of creation. And Jesus is the God of creation. Jews and Pharisees and Romans and pagans of all stripes are not in control. Jesus dies when he decides. Even though they want to, they're not getting it. That's just Proverbs 16, 1 and 4. The plans of the heart belong to the man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. In verse 4, the Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. It's not time to die yet because the good shepherd is still gathering in sheep at this moment. Look at the next verses. 40 through 42, he went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. So he, he leaves, he exits, he retreats to the wilderness on the other side of the Jordan. The Jordan River runs north and south. Jerusalem and Israel, that, the, the promised land is on the west side of it. Jesus goes to the east side of that, where John the Baptist was. And we know that in, in real estate, what is, the, what is the mantra? Location, location, location. If you're not in a good location, it's not going to get a good sale. And, and you're not going to get, you know, if you have a business, you're not gonna, if you don't have foot traffic or car traffic, you're not going to, nobody's going to come. It seems to be the opposite of that in the Bible. How does anybody even find John the Baptist on the other side of the Jordan? Who is he preaching to before the first person stumbles upon him? Is he just yelling at cactuses? And then now Jesus retreats to the other side. Then who comes? His sheep come. Because what do his sheep do? They hear his voice and they follow. They come to him and he knows them and he calls them by name. And what do they say? This is a fascinating thing. They're, they're where John the Baptist was, and these people must have been familiar with John the Baptist's ministry, who is by now dead. He's been beheaded by Herod. So they know that, and they kind of know where he was, and maybe they were still out there when Jesus came out there for kind of a retreat and a respite. But what do they say? They say, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. John the Baptist didn't do any miracles, but man, he was dead on right when it came to this guy Jesus. He told us, behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. The man who, who I'm not fit to untie his shoes. He was right about all of that. They were familiar with John the Baptist. And, and look at the difference between these humble souls and the temple crowd. The temple crowd says, we're ignoring your works because of your words. And then these humble souls out in the wilderness, they're like, 
man, John didn't do any works, but we sure do believe his words. He was right about this. I mean, this is just the, the obvious parallel we're supposed to see. Believers say, the elect say, we're going to come to Jesus based on his words alone. Whether or not he improves my physical condition or my financial condition or any of those things. Because he is who he says he is. Unbelievers say, you know what? We're going to hate Jesus for his words and we're going to ignore his works. So when we look at that, we got to consider, look at this takeaway for this text, from this text for, our, for the church that we must be a people that prioritizes the word. At the exclusion of deeds, absolutely not, because this word tells us what to do. That if you see your brother and sister without clothing and in need of daily food, and you say to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, you have done nothing for them. Your faith is worthless, James 2 says. So we have to have those deeds. Now we have to be changed by the word, but... This text shows us that souls will be saved by words. And earlier in John, we, show, we were shown that works alone will never be enough. It didn't convince the crowd who ate food to their fill in the middle of the wilderness when Jesus broke the bread and the fish. The words, they're here for the words. John didn't do anything, but man, he was right. And then what does it say in verse 42? Many believed in him there. So no matter how copious or how generous our deeds, the unbelieving world is still going to hate us for what we say, for what we confess to be true. It's not that we revel in that. It's not that we wear that as some badge of honor, that we want to be antagonistic, that we want to be uh, uh, people who's always a chip on our shoulder and fighting them, and we love to be hated like we're some kind of uh, anti-hero. That's not it. That's not it at all. What we need to look at it is like a church with no money, with no resources, with no grouping of professionals who have skills that can be dispersed, can that kind of church still be a faithful, biblical, useful church? Oftentimes, whenever we're struggling with something on how to apply the scriptures, we got to take it out of our time period and out of our location. And if it doesn't fly there, then it shouldn't fly here. Or it shouldn't be mandatory here, rather. So let's take this. If, if all we're to do is good works and deeds and to give money and to clothing and to and distribute food and to help people socially and all of those things, what if we had no money? What if we had no resources? What if we were a church completely comprised of uneducated, illiterate, poverty-stricken people? Could we still be a faithful New Testament church useful for the glory of God for evangelism and discipleship? The Great Commission. Absolutely we could, right? Our churches in the Congo right now, faithful, they don't have therapists. They don't have uh, wealthy donors. They don't have uh, doctors or lawyers or, or other professionals that can give out free resources and care. But are they faithful churches? What about our brothers and sisters in Haiti or Ethiopia or Cambodia? Can they be faithful churches without the ability to do great, wonderful deeds? Absolutely they can. Now, does that mean that they, sh they shouldn't be doing what they can do? No, because what did the church have in Acts chapter 2? They had nothing. They were mostly comprised of slaves and poor people. But they had all things in common, meaning they shared what they had. But their emphasis was on what? What did they give themselves to? What does it say in Acts chapter 2? They gave themselves to the apostles' teaching and to prayer. They gave themselves to that. And then the things, the meeting, the needs, that, that took care of itself. Because the word was instructing them, and they were like, oh, well, that guy's in need. Well, of course I should give to him. That family has a, I mean, of course I can help them out. But we can't get that cart before the horse. Because we need to look at where God has invested his power. Sproul would always say, R.C. Sproul would always say, one of the greatest flaws of the modern church is that we don't believe that God has invested his power in the word. If we believe that he's invested his power in the word, then that changes everything because God can make money appear in the mouth of a fish, right? He does that with the apostle, with Peter. And God can make a widow's oil never run out, can he not? He does that with Elijah and Elisha. He just keeps pouring keeps, so they can keep eating. But what are we commissioned to do? Romans 10, 14 and 15. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? 
And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? Our deeds and our works are critical. And without them, our salvation is in question. But they follow behind our heralding of the word. We herald the word of God because that is what the people came. At the end of this chapter, when Jesus is threatened with death, they came because of what somebody said about him. We believe your words, and now we come to the Savior, and we believe in him. And that secures their souls for eternity. That's what we do. That's what we get excited about. That's what animates us, and that's what informs all of the wonderful mercy ministries that we do. They're fueled by the word of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we look at a text like this. We look at your son. We look at him handling your word. We look at him speaking to those who hate him. We look at him drawing those who are weary and heavy laden and giving them rest. And we see ourselves in, in all of those positions. Of, of being frustrated with what Jesus says, what the Bible says, of being embarrassed when we think we know what the Word says and we stake a lot of our uh, life and lifestyle on it only to be proven wrong by a, a simple, have you ever read, like Jesus did. But Lord, we've also been those, those uh, humble souls who are familiar with John but maybe still hadn't really had that life-altering, eternal life-forgiving interaction with Jesus, and that they came to him out in the wilderness, and that Jesus is faithful to save, or that we can read to the end of this chapter, Lord, and be tempted to think, is anybody going to believe? Because it just looks like we've had 10 chapters of nobody believing of there being miracles upon miracles. And nobody, well, very few, believing. But we get to the end of this chapter and we have a resounding answer to that question. Will anybody believe the simple gospel that Jesus preached? The answer is yes. Many came to where he was. Not in a popular position, not in an easily accessible platform out in the wilderness on the east side of the Jordan, and they came because you brought them to your son and your son says that all that you bring to him he will never cast out he will hold tightly for eternity and so we look at ourselves and we want to be those humble souls we want to be those who came to him and said everything John said about this man was right and then they believed in Jesus not in John their faith wasn't in the preacher their faith wasn't wasn't in the words that were spoken but who the words that were spoken directed them to. And that's your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for being so mighty and gracious to save. Thank you for being so clear in your word, for giving us black ink on white paper to read and to reread and to re-re-read over and again, to know who you are throughout all generations that you've preserved for millennia. We're reading the same Bible that was being read in 231 A.D., being read in 1517 A.D., 1886 A.D. We have that because you are faithful to preserve, because you want to be known. Your voice is calling your people together. And may that drive us to worship. May that inspire awe in us of who you are. You will not be defied. Your plan will not be deterred. And everything will always happen according to your decree. And we worship that kind of God. For that is the kind of God you are. And you have made it plain to us in the scriptures. Thank you for that gift. And thank you for the living word, the Lord Jesus, in whom is our hope. And through whom we can come to you with uh, childlike boldness into the throne room of a father. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.